We'll please to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. Luke, chapter 21, while you're turning there. I mentioned this on Wednesday night. Recently, I thought I had a bright idea to have printed what I call a new birth certificates. Gave a couple of these to some of our girls last time, or last week, uh, to mark their name, when they got saved, the date, the time of the day, and uh, signed their name to it. I wrote my name on, on it because I prayed with each of them. Uh, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, Acts 16.31. I, and by the way, when I gave this, I had a print shop do it because I'm not too uh, savvy at uh, doing it myself just over the Internet. Uh, she emailed me back a proof, and she had changed my text to, I, had, I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, no, switch it back to, I believed on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, there's a fine distinction in the English language. You can believe in aspirin in principle, as a theory. But do you believe on it enough to take one when you have a headache? And she said, I get it now. So she switched it back. So I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, Acts 1631. I ask him to forgive my sins, and I am now born again, John 3, verse 5. According to the Holy Bible, I am trusting him alone with my eternity. I thought I was clever. I thought I was all that by having these designed. And I mentioned this on Wednesday night in our Bible study. And then after we were finished, my mom opened her Bible and she had a slip of paper that said new birth certificate <laughs> that she had received the day she got saved. That 1950, 1951, 68 years ago, She's had it in her Bible ever since on parchment papers, very nicely done. So someone beat me to it 68 years <laughs> earlier. But uh, it was a blessing to see it. I had never seen it before. Still in good shape. But I told some folks, put that in your Bible and keep it as a permanent reminder of when and where and the circumstances you under which you got saved. Anyway... Let's move to our sermon this hour, for this hour. Luke chapter 21. And I'm going to read verses 34 to 36. Luke 21, verses 34 through 36. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. The word surfeiting, verse 34, doesn't mean surfing. It's not the same word, dude. <laughs> surfeiting is a... Uh, marvelous English word. It means to, to eat or to drink uh, so much so to excess until it makes you sick. You know, there are some things you can get too much of until they become bad things. You can eat too much, too much food without any exercise to keep the metabolism going, just eat and eat and eat. Uh, it's bad for your health and your body shows it. There are some people who think too much money actually brings more problems than they could have ever imagined. We think the more money I have, the better. Now, money answers a lot of problems in life, but it's temporary. One of these days, uh, I'm going to be part owner of the universe. So alongside that, all the money in this earth <laughs> uh, pales. And so are you, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. But you can't read the Bible too often, can you? And you can't pray too much. Notice verse 36, Watch ye therefore, and pray always. Earlier in the book of Luke, we read, uh, Christ spake a parable unto them that men ought always to pray 
and not to faint, Luke 18, verse 1. It's the thing we need more of. It's the thing we clearly never get too much of. And it's the thing we do too little of. That is to pray. Um, you might be a church-going Christian, and you might be a Bible-reading and erstwhile uh, student of the Bible, but are you, and this is my title of the day, a praying Christian? The Praying Christian is my title for today. And you might write this down as the first point. The sign of prayer. The sign of prayer. All religions pray. The idea of God and prayer are inseparable. Belief in God and the belief in the need to pray to God in some way are joined together. That much all religious beliefs have in common. Now, the practices uh, and the customs of some people in the world to us may seem crude and primitive, but the instinct to pray is universal. Now, the teachings uh, or the teaching in the Old Testament is full of the subject of prayer. Everywhere you'll find commands and inducements, um, injunctions for men to pray. The Lord says, quote, Offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Psalm 50, verses 14 to 15. Now, doctrinally, prophetically, the day of trouble may be a reference to the great day of tribulation. I believe that it is. But devotionally, the day of trouble is here today, right now. It was here yesterday, and it'll show up again tomorrow. You're living in a day of trouble. Uh, this day of trouble just happens to be uh, July 21st, 2019. Uh, the day of trouble will be July 22nd, 2019, when you wake up in the morning. King David told God, For thou, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, hast revealed to thy servant, saying, I will build thee an house. Therefore hath thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. 2 Samuel 7, verse 27. The response of the mind and the response of the heart should be to pray. Because of God's blessings, because of God's protection, and because of God's promise to you. You know, the basis of our prayer life is sonship, S-O-N. It's natural for a child to ask things of his father, and it's reasonable for the father to listen to the child and consider what's being asked. The Lord Jesus taught, quote, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Matthew 7, verse 11. The Lord, or rather the Bible says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, verse 9. And the Lord's purposes regarding prayer are certainly going to be higher than yours. And his reasons for asking his plan and his desires and what he wants to accomplish through it are going to be greater than anything you could think of or imagine. God speaks in, uh, uh, about prayer, or rather, he speaks of prayer in terms of wonder or wonderment. The Lord appeared to a disciple named Ananias. And we read in Acts chapter 9, The Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. Acts 9 verse 11. To him, there's nothing more glorious than prayer. One of the most blessed things in God's universe is a Christian who is in the regular habit of praying. Like I said at the, the outset, it's the thing we need more of, and yet the thing we do so very little of, that is talk to God in prayer. 
The only thing that's more astounding is the Christian who knows these things, but still doesn't pray. Go figure. The Apostle Paul wrote, Afterward, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. Galatians 1, 21 through 24. That testimony came after his conversion experience. When Paul says God wanted, quote, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Galatians 1, 16. And just as an aside, while I'm wiping my eyes, run the references to the word heathen in the word of God. You'll find it means Gentiles, but among all the Gentiles, anyone non-Jewish, specifically at the top of the list, it means white people. White Gentiles. I'm a heathen. Or at least I was. Not anymore. Saul of Tarsus had been a praying man all of his life. But it wasn't until he became a, a son of God by the new birth, by salvation, that he began to pray on God's terms and pray in the way that God interprets prayer. People with a lot of religion might think they know God, but it may be that God doesn't know them. They've never been introduced at the cross of Calvary by faith. That's what a sinner needs. And until that happens, uh, they'll never have the ear of God. And let me add this. If you're a Christian and you know when you were saved, you know how you were saved, you know the circumstances under which you were saved, and you have no doubt that if you died right now, you'd wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ. But you're engaged in some sin. You know it's sin. Your Christian friends, they know it's sin. They've told you. They've tried to remind you. But your flesh gets some sort of satisfaction from it. You don't want to give it up. Don't expect God to be listening to you. I think I mentioned this last week when we talked about repentance. Psalm 66, verse 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Isaiah 59, verse 2 says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. God hears. I mean, God's God. He hears everything. But he's not obligated to respond until you deal with the sin in your heart, the sin in, you're trying to keep secret, hoping none of your other Christian friends learn about, hoping that it doesn't come out to light, come to light, rather, and uh, you'll be found to be uh, less than the Christian you're pretending to be. But God wants to answer prayer. God wants to answer the prayers of those who know him. With him, there's a, a sort of a ring of joy, like the, the, the parable of the lost sheep. Quote, And if so be he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more, than, uh, uh, more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Matthew 18, verse 13. God delights in answering prayer. Think of the woman who found the lost coin, Luke chapter 15. Or the prodigal son who returned home to his father in Luke 15. And they all said, let's rejoice. Let's rejoice over this thing. God said to Ananias, hey, behold, he prayeth. God was impressed. God gets impressed by some things. You think, well, how could I possibly impress God? Tell you what, start praying every day. And God said, boy, he sure changed, hasn't he? Well, she's more devout than she used to be. He's more dedicated than he used to be. It's good to see. It's good to know. It's good to hear. I don't mind listening to them. With that little prayer we learned as children, God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. I wonder how often God ever listened to that. Did he ever listen to it? I remember when my 
youngest one, I think Sarah, was um, all about four. I'd go in the kids' uh, bedroom at night and make sure they prayed, said, you know, bedtime prayers and learning to thank God, learning to talk to God. I didn't put words in their mouths. I didn't tell them what to say. But when you hear a three-year-old, four-year-old talking to God on her own, don't you know God's listening to that? Yeah. There's no, nothing artificial. There's nothing contrived. There's nothing being forced. You're not teaching her how to repeat the same words like some kid in a catechism class. She's learning to talk to God. That's the way it should be. And um, God said to Ananias about uh, Saul of Tarsus, Behold, he prayeth. You know, we, we go through the same words and the same format time and time again. And it's easy to fall into that old, worn-out pattern and habit. No, God's blessed my breakfast and God's listening to it. Oh, don't worry. The bacon, the eggs are okay. Don't worry about that. Uh, we say, bless this, bless that, bless this, bless that. And you often wonder, does it have any um, a power with God? We use that word bless so often, like bless me with holy water, bless me with the sign of the cross, bless me with that. And you wonder, does God really take our prayers as seriously as they ought to be taken? You ought to remember that God's saints are partners with God in the ministry of prayer. God gave Ananias the sign of prayer as proof that his grace was now working in the Apostle Paul. Behold, he prayeth. There's some action taking place, and God was impressed by that. Is there anything better, or rather I should say not anything, but is there any better uh, proof that a man is a man of God than that he's a man of prayer? You know, it's the only sign that even the unbelieving world accepts as evidence that somebody knows God. Well, he's, a, he's praying all the time. When we talk about prayer, we mean someone who truly knows God because he's been forgiven of his sins and his name is in heaven. Prayer uh, for that man or that woman makes all the difference. It gives them a new assurance of their salvation when they go to God. Uh, it renews their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ every time they begin speaking to Him. You no, know, a, a, a renewed fellowship with God every time they pray. The Southwest Radio Church used to sign off their program saying, Remember that God is still on the throne and prayer changes things. Prayer links your soul with the eternal, infinite soul of Almighty God. Think about that. Yeah. You're no longer strangers, but friends, the Lord Jesus said. But the sign of prayer is a very powerful sign indeed. The second thing you can write down, point number two, is the lesson. The lesson of prayer. And what I mean by that is learning to pray. John the Baptist gave his disciples some form by which they could approach God and pray. Christ's disciples asked him to teach them as well. Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples, Luke 11, verse 1. His own praying stirred in them the desire to do the same. But when they wanted to pray, they found they didn't know how. And they came to the Lord Jesus asking him to teach them. Forms are always much easier than a creative spirit. Prayer is counted on a string of beads or a knotted rope uh, are much easier than pouring out your soul to God in genuine uh, anguish oftentimes or in 
uh, praise and gratitude and thanksgiving for everything he's blessed you with. It's much easier than to pray from the soul. But it's not other people's prayers that uh, make someone a man or a woman of prayer. Uh, true prayer that prevails, true prayer that triumphs with God uh, is intimate, it's personal, and it's original. You see, it's original. When Hannah prayed for a son, she told Eli, the priest, that she had uh, poured out her soul before the Lord. 1 Samuel 1, verse 15. We read that Elijah's power with prayer was that he prayed earnestly. According to James 5, verse 17, he didn't just say a prayer, he prayed. And there's a, di there's a marked difference between those two ideas. His whole self, his whole personality was poured into what he was saying to God. He meant what he was saying. He wanted what he was asking of God. And he was successful. Can that be said about you? Or let me ask this. Can that kind of praying be taught? That might be a better question. And uh, there might be some believers who disagree with me on this, what I'm about to say. But this is... My sermon, this is Pastor Shribe today. There's no way to learn except by doing it. No philosophy of prayer, no textbook, no Bible college course on the subject of prayer can teach you how to prevail in prayer except you getting on your knees, on your face, and doing it. That's how you learn. Amen. Amen. You can read a book about riding a bicycle, but until you get on it, you're not going to learn how to ride it. Amen. Romans 8, 26 says, We know not what we should pray for as we ought. Well, if prayer waits for perfect understanding of what it wants from God and how it wants to ask it from God, it'll never get started. It'll never get off the ground. Thomas Edison once said, we don't know the millionth part of 1% about anything. We don't know what water is. We don't know what light is. We don't know what gravitation is. We don't know what enables us to keep on our feet when we stand up. We don't know what electricity is. We don't know what heat is. We don't know anything about magnetism. We have a lot of hypotheses about these things, but that is all. But we don't let our ignorance about these things deprive us of their use. Take that same thinking and apply it to prayer. Think of the very idea of praying. You, as a man or a woman, can approach the eternal and the infinite deity who spoke and all of known reality came into existence. What kind of privilege is that? What kind of benefit is that? How could I even describe how to begin doing it? I don't think anybody could accurately describe how to begin doing that. You just do it. You just do it. Your heart is linked to the heart of God, your soul with the soul of the Heavenly Father. Those who ever became mighty in prayer learned how to pray by simply doing it, by simply praying. They didn't talk about prayer. They didn't memorize prayers. They prayed. The Lord Jesus offered a parable about the publican and the Pharisee. Both went down to the temple to pray. Everyone respected the publican because of their religious reputation. They all, they, they, rather, the, he respected the Pharisee because of their religious reputations. But everyone despised the publicans. They were tax collectors. They were a local IRS agent. He was, he was the kind of guy that wanted to shut down a little kid's lemonade stand and get the taxes from it. That's how nasty they were. And the Pharisee prayed loudly and proudly about his piety with God boasting to God about himself. 
But the publican simply cried, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you, this man, the publican, went down to his house justified rather than the other. Uh, for everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Luke 18, verse 14. Jesus declared the great masses of people in the world, educated, uneducated alike, to be incapable of prayer the way God desires it to be done. To pray the way God wants you to pray is the greatest achievement in the world. It really is. And it can't be done without the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, such a life of prayer might cost you something. It takes time. Hurried prayer or resorting to some boring pre-written phrases they can never produce souls that become mighty with God in prayer. A student spends much time studying a particular subject to become proficient in it. Why should we think that you can just hurry through and achieve something with God because you're repeating a prayer or someone taught you in kindergarten? It doesn't work that way. The Lord Jesus rose before daybreak in order to pray, Mark 1, verse 35. He spent all night in prayer, according to Luke 6, verse 12. Every praying saint learns to spend time with God in prayer. When you read the biographies of some great Christians in the past, you realize their secret, the secret of their success with the Lord Jesus was prayer. David Brainerd was a missionary to the Delaware Indians, here in the U.S. in the 1700s. And in his journal, he wrote about going out into the woods for hours just to be alone and talking to God. And he described it as being a man in a rowboat that was drifting farther and farther away from the shore. The more time he spent with God, he was leaving the cares of the world behind. And it was only the, the, need, the pressing needs of the day, things he had to do, that forced him to stop his prayer and get about his business. D.L. Moody said he had a 4 a.m. business meeting each morning. He meant with the Lord Jesus Christ to talk to him in prayer. And he was one of the greatest evangelists this country ever produced. You read about George Mueller. He's famous for prayer. George Mueller ran an orphanage in London, England, 1830s, 1820s. And at one time, he had uh, 700 women and children, orphans, under his charge, depending on him to provide for them. And George Mueller vowed that he would never go out and publicly raise money. He would never go out and publicly ask for a penny. There was a collection box on the outside of the mission where he worked. And he would pray that God would, send, would burden somebody's heart. And people who knew about his work would come by and put money in that box anonymously and be on their way. And he said time after time he would go and he would check that box and it would be just enough to buy food and milk and uh, to provide for all the people that were depending on him. And in his journal in one place, and I read it, he said, I rose and spent nearly two hours in prayer before breakfast. I now feel much more comfortable. Two hours in prayer? You can't spend two hours in prayer talking to God without having God talk to you eventually. That's the way it should be for the believer. That's the way it ought to be for the believer. But uh, I'm no fool, and I realize, you know something? If a tithe is 10%, and you know where I'm going with this, if you've heard me say it before. If a tithe is 10% when we take collections, then 
That means you owe God two hours and 40 minutes of your time every day. That's a tenth. I'm not a fool. I realize that kind of sacrifice with most people's schedules would be next to impossible. But could you, would you, get out of bed and be diligent enough to spend five minutes talking to God in prayer? Just five minutes. Might have to set a timer, set your cell phone. I promise you, if you say, God, whatever it is that comes to my mind, I'm going to talk to you about. I'm going to ask you about. I'm going to thank you for. I'm going to pour out my needs to you because I don't know where else to turn. And I'm going to thank you for the things I've, I've got, the blessings I have. If I am just begin to enumerate them, begin to list them, I promise you, the timer will go off more quickly than you thought. It'll go off when you're still in the mid-sentence. And you'll tell yourself, man, I, I wish I had more time. Well, the next day, set it for seven minutes. Set it for ten minutes. And you know where I'm going with that. But the only way to become a man of prayer, a woman of prayer, is by doing it. Not by reading about it, not by hearing about it, not by uh, admiring other people who can great give you their story about it, but by doing it. Um, if I said to pray for five minutes, some of you would run out of words to say after 30 seconds. That's how cold your hearts are. That's how carnal you are. That's how little of God you have in you from day-to-day -day fellowship with them. But some of you, for some of you, the timer would go off and you'd say, man, I, I could do again for another five minutes, another 10 minutes. And you build on that, build from there. That's the way to do it. The word uh, disciple, the root of disciple is discipline. You can't become a good disciple unless you're disciplined. The only way to learn how to pray is by praying. And point number three, the last point, consider prayer in secret. Prayer in secret. If praying is the greatest achievement in the world, then um, it certainly calls for great discipline. Learning to concentrate your mind, uh, focus your thoughts, is more difficult than hammering a nail. It takes real dedication with the Lord. To become a praying Christian has a cost. Not so much a cost in, in agonizing, you know, sweat and tears and so forth when you pray, although those may come, but uh, daily devotion to it. You can do it today, but will you do it tomorrow? You might do it the next day, but what about the day after that? It's kind of like making those New Year's resolutions. Right? Tomorrow I'm going to wake up and I promise I'm not going to smoke ever again. By January 2nd, you're already lighting them up again. Now, I'm hoping nobody here is a smoker. But you get the point. Discipline is what makes disciples. If you're a disciple, it means you put yourself under the instruction of someone else who can teach you. The Lord Jesus Christ should be your perfect example. He's the one that can teach you. And one of the first things he commands uh, his disciples is that they be, there be a place of prayer. Now, obviously, the whole world belongs to God. There's no place where he can't see us. There's no place where he can't hear our prayer. But it was Jesus' habit to withdraw into a solitary place to pray. He taught them Matthew 6, verses 5 and 6. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites do, or excuse me, as the hypocrites are, for they are... <laughs> For they like to love to pray standing in the synagogue and in their corners of the street, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Hypocrites never pray in secret. They want people to see them. They want people to notice them uh, praying. 
And that's how the world likes to respond. They see someone praying. How many times have I seen pictures of the Pope in a magazine or on television, and he's you know, down on his knees somewhere in some chapel, and he's got his hands folded in front of him on the, they have a, you know, Catholics like to use a little kneeler for the purpose of, of kneeling down in prayer. You know, you can't pray unless you have the right furniture and so forth. Um, I remember watch, seeing a magazine article about Jerry Falwell and the religious right. There was a picture of, of uh, Reverend Falwell uh, on his knees with his hands in front of him praying in his hotel room. And I thought, who took that picture? Yeah. Why are you posing for pictures in the so-called posture of prayer? They did the same thing with Billy Graham. But uh, in some ways, I, all of those men were being hypocrites. You don't need an audience to watch you pray. You don't need someone to see you. And, but, you know, in the world's eyes, that creates a reputation of a person of real piety and closeness to God. But they don't count, those things don't count with God. Real prayer is between your soul and the soul of God alone. The soul needs its quiet place. There you learn how to pray. And um, there's no lesson quite like solitude once in a while. Quite like solitude once in a while. Our kids, not, not this coming week, but the week from, week from now, our kids are going to our, our annual church camp. And it's amazing, and they can tell you similar stories. We go to a campground. There are other church groups using the facility at the same, the same week we're there. And you can tell that that other church has no knowledge of God because they bring the city with them. There's, uh, our church group isn't big enough to uh, merit the big chapel that this camp place has available. But other church groups, either, maybe, or maybe they pay more to use that big chapel for their so-called church chapel services. And they have bigger groups than we do. But uh, last year, or two years ago, forget which, you see a truck backing in, unloading all the rock music equipment, the big speakers and the sets of drums and everything, into the, into the camp chapel. You'd, here you are, you're trying to get away from the city, you're trying to leave the internet, leave television, leave the radio, leave your uh, iPod, leave your Game Boy, whatever, whatever the game system is, or leave all that stuff um, behind and get away from it all and uh, collect your thoughts and be alone with God for a while and people bring it with them, and there's no solitude. They, their minds are always cluttered and filled up with everything going on in society and in entertainment. And there is no separation between the world and them. But um, if some of you, I'm going to try to bring this to a close in a minute. If some of you were shut in a room for 30 minutes alone with God, it would revolutionize your life. It really would. It used to be an old gospel song, How Long Has It Been Since You Talked With The Lord And Told Him Your Heart's Hidden Secret? How Long Since You Prayed? How Long Since You Stayed On Your Knees Till The Light Shone Through? And um, you might not have a lot of privacy at your house or your household. You might have to lock yourself in the bathroom and get down by the bathtub or even on the, the sit-down place. And talk to God alone. Because there's nowhere else to go. And you want to pour out your heart to God. Pour out your soul to God. You have needs that only God can meet. But are you a man of character or a woman, Christian woman of character to bring those needs to God and let him deal with them as only he can?